Let's now cross over the borders and go to our northern neighbor and go to the northernmost part of that country, Ethiopia. There have been clashes between government forces and government and uh, the Tigray People's Liberation Front, which is the one that controls the Tigrayan region. So according to what we're seeing in the news coverage this morning, just looking at various head headlines, last one hour, BBC News says Ethiopia's tree gray crisis, civilians massacred, says Amnesty International. CNN, mass killings of civilians in Ethiopia's Tigray region, according to Amnesty. And one hour ago as well, on Sky News, dozens hacked to death as Tigray region fighting intensifies, according to Amnesty International. So Amnesty International has come up with this report and they say that uh, there was a lot of uh, civilian um, death that was witnessed around Monday in that region, in the Tigray, in the northern uh, Ethiopian region. And this was, according to Amnesty International, orchestrated by the forces that are loyal to TPLF, that's the Tigray People's Liberation Front. You know what has been happening here. It's a large-scale conflict between the government, the national government, and the, the local administration of the Tigray region. And we have seen also hundreds of people, actually thousands of people, reportedly crossing over from their country into Sudan where they're seeking refuge. And Sudan has already said they're going to set up a, a refugee camp that's going to accommodate the people who are crossing over this region. What is this that's happening in Ethiopia? And why is it just, you know, uh, so sudden? It appears like it's something that was really building over time and a long time. And then it just hit that boiling point. Mm. I don't think it, it's, it, it's been boiling, yes, mm. but it didn't start boiling yesterday. Yep. No. Uh, what Ethiopia has is something that was experimented on uh, in Yugoslavia, the former Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's usually termed as ethnic federalism. It comes with very many challenges. Mm. You have a federal government. Essentially, you are semi-autonomous. But it is your people who speak your language, you have your culture, who have your background. And the government that happened to have been in power before I, Abiy Ahmed came in was dominated by people from the Tigrayan area. Mm. So, remember, there were protests by people who come from the Oromea area, mm. the Oromo, okay? Mm -hmm. Over a period of time, over a period of time, and there are those who argue this was, is, it's what ushered in the current prime minister. Someone who represented younger people. Mm -hmm. Now, whatever they were protesting about, you see, you protest about something, one leader leaves. The person uh, who leaves represents a community who also felt that they were in power. Now they feel disenfranchised, and many, there have been complaints that they're actually being targeted. And they're actually being left out of the decision-making process. It's a political situation that is not uncommon. But when you have regions of the country that are militarized, they have their own police, they have their own army, so to speak. So the semi-autonomy basically means that they even have power over security. They do. In their region. They do. And the regions are formed, just like you said, it's ethnic mm. uh, conclaves. Mm. Huh. They do. All right. They do. So, mm. if there's an issue that arises and it revolves around, remember how this one was parked off? Yep. Oh, these fellows attacked a federal a military. Yes, a federal, military. federal military. Yes. And then it just escalated and it continued and it continued. And there are many other stories that will come out of this. Mm. This one is not going to end soon. Hmm. Let's bring in our expert, Horn of Africa analyst Rashid Abdi who are speaking to us about Somalia now. Let's talk to him about Ethiopia. Good morning, Rashid. Good morning to you. It's good to have you again on the show, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to the Situation Room. Thank you very much. So let's just start by setting the, the stage for everybody to understand the situation in uh, Ethiopia. So we've got a Tigray region, we've got a federal government. What are uh, these other regions and how is it that, uh, how has this political game been played out over the last, let's say, three decades or so? Yes. Um, Ethiopia's uh, state is structured in a, it, it, basically it is a federal uh, system. And uh, what makes uh, Ethiopia's uh, federal system unique, I think, is the fact that they have accepted the idea of uh, ethnicity uh, or ethnic-based federalism. Mm. And uh, this ethnic-based federalism 
was designed, I think, by Meles and his uh, people uh, in the early 90s as part of uh, um, a strategy to accommodate uh, ethno-nationalism and ethno-regionalism. And um, to some extent, it did, I think, bring down some of the tensions uh, that were in the country. Mm -hmm. um, it gave the regions uh, greater autonomy um, for them to be able to feel uh, that they are governing themselves. Mm. Um, but then I think because the federal system uh, eventually didn't work out properly, we saw how quickly discontent uh, began building up in many of these uh, federal states. And it was this, um, I think, discontent that eventually uh, catapulted um, uh, Prime Minister Abiy to power because there were six years of rolling non-stop uh, discontent and uh, uprising in many parts of Ethiopia that eventually culminated in uh, um, you know, the crisis which led to Abiy becoming the prime minister. So yes, um, I think one has to understand that context, uh, the ethnic uh, federal arrangement that to some extent did uh, help uh, stabilize Ethiopia but because it didn't work out properly, I think eventually uh, began to foment uh, the crisis we see today. So even with this and how then the prime minister came to be prime minister, then there are certain uh, sections of the population that are not happy, isn't it? If we can put it as simply as that. Yes, there has been um, a lot of uh, um, discontent and protests in uh, Oromia for a number of years. Mm. Despite the fact that uh, the prime minister is Oromo, mm. we have seen actually um, Oromo discontent actually escalate. Yep. Mm. And uh, this also problem has, has also intensified in other parts. The Tigray problem is also a, a classic um, center-periphery tension, which has escalated and now has become a serious uh, conflict. Mm. How have they run their governments? I mean, yes, there is a federal system, ethnic based have they been con have they had consensus as in some sort of coalition understanding where when it comes to running the actual government of ethiopia people feel that they are represented there have been attempts uh, to um, build some kind of uh, cohesion between the various ethnic uh, communities in ethiopia and um, the eprdf i think was a precursor um, the, it, it, the Ethiopian People's uh, Revolutionary Democratic Front basically was a coalition of, of a number of parties. Um, and uh, Prime Minister Abi actually uh, dismantled the, the old EPRDF and built his own prosperity party, mm. but along the same model, which is uh, bringing together uh, all these ethnic uh, constituencies into some kind of a grand umbrella. Something like the Jubilee Alliance of Kenya, for example. Uh, the idea is the same. It's about uh, building a big tent kind of uh, politics in, in Ethiopia. Mm. But uh, unfortunately, it hasn't worked out because Abi, despite those positive traits, I think has, has become, uh, has monopolized power, um, has actually bypassed many of those uh, party and, uh, um, you know, governmental institutions and has become essentially, I think, a one-man uh, rule which um, has, has, I think, uh, exacerbated or aggravated the current crisis in Ethiopia. Sure, so with the current crisis that we see, then if we're looking specifically, what is the bone of contention? To push for this shared government, shared way of doing things, to remove the current prime minister that has then now resulted in the clashes that we see. What is the one thing that we would say, if this was sorted out, then you would likely see steps towards peace? Um, the current crisis is, uh, um, has been brought about by, I think, many factors. Um, and it was very clear uh, for a number of months that this crisis will eventually end up in a conflict because what we saw was basically one escalation after another. Mm. The prime minister cancelled uh, the elections, and, uh, uh, which were due in August this year, and said that... Um, this was because of the COVID uh, situation in the country. Um, the TPLF dissented and basically said that uh, there is no way they can uh, postpone the elections. And then they went ahead and actually 
con- uh, held their own elections, uh, which were concluded uh, a month ago. Um, so that was one major, I think, uh, bone of contention, that uh, you had uh, a region basically breaking away from, from the central arrangement, electoral arrangement, and conducting its own election. That was seen as a huge um, challenge to the prime minister. Um, but then there were other, I think, factors, one of, uh, some of them historical. The TPLF uh, basically retreated back to uh, Tigray, and uh, it, uh, we, it was part of the um, coalition, the EPRDF, and uh, exercised a lot of power uh, during Meles's time. Mm-hmm. Now, once Abiy came to power, he, he, he began dismantling some of the power structures which gave the TPLF uh, you know, that leverage. Um, TPLF officers were were removed from from major uh, parastatals of the state. Mm-hmm. Um, a major uh, military industrial uh, complex uh, where the TPLF had uh, a lot of power was was uh, uh, dismantled. So there was, uh, I think, a deliberate uh, effort by Prime Minister Abiy to basically undermine the TPLF. But was it undermining the TPLF or was it trying to bring about equity? Because you could argue yeah. that um, one of the things that even elevated him to power is because there was a lot of disgruntlement among the population that the Tigray had dominated positions of leadership for a long time. That's one way of, of looking at it. Um, but there was a, a undeniably um, a very deep purge of uh, the TPLF. Uh, but then that was not enough. I think um, the TPLF was a very strong party. The region was very uh, influential. And uh, all the, I think, maneuvers by Prime Minister B in, in, in the last two years have been geared towards, uh, I think, dismantling uh, the TPLF and uh, Tigray, to weaken Tigray. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- there should be no, I think, um, uh, doubt that this is a Prime Minister who has been plotting for many years to bring down the TPLF and also to destroy, uh, to basically uh, weaken Tigray. And he has found a very powerful ally in the president of Eritrea, uh, Isaias Afewerki. Isaias Afewerki uh, has a lot of unfinished business with Tigray. Tigray was a front line during the border conflict. Mm-hmm. And, and that was actually one of the reasons why the prime minister has been very, Cozy with the Afewerki. They have a common interest in uh, in basically undermining TPLF power, but also weakening uh, Tigray region. So with this, these are all the combination of factors I think that have uh, created the current crisis. With this, with this purge on the TPLF and the weakening of the Tigray in the federal government, can you say that there's been any um, specific beneficiary, like any other region, that then you can say has benefited from this? Uh, weakening of the Tigray? Well, I think there were, in the initial months there was a perception that um, this was just um, a change of one ethnic hegemony for another. That was the perception that was created in the country, but that is not true. I think Prime Minister Abiy has, 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 has um, tried to, to, to make the Ethiopian state much more inclusive. He has brought in my, uh, more women. Um, he has also, uh, I think, brought in other historically marginalized communities into government, like Somalis, uh, like, uh, you know, the Gurage, like, you know, many other uh, ethnicities have been brought into government. So to some extent, there was that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think attempt to project uh, the current Ethiopia and Abiy as as a kind of a much more inclusive government. Where the problem, I think, lies is the fact that beyond these um, uh, gestures in, in, in cabinet, that um, inclusiveness was not reflected uh, in, in the regions and in many other parts of Ethiopia. And we saw how the prime minister basically went after, the, basically uh, monopolized power in the Oromia region, uh, locked up all the Oromo leaders, um, cracked down very heavily uh, against the Oromo rebels. Um, and that was seen as basically um, counterproductive because this was a prime minister who essentially um, was, you know, elevated to power largely on the back of uh, the Oromo uh, protest movement. And for him to go uh, and crack down heavily 
uh, against uh, that same movement, I think was viewed as, as hugely uh, disappointing to the Oromo. And that explains why there is this huge unrest in Oromia. So I think um, the, the, the legacy of Prime Minister B in terms of inclusivity is, is a mixed one. Um, Rashid, then I've got to ask you, if you talk about this and his legacy, the very thing that is, according to what you're saying, the very thing that is bringing about this crisis is the very thing that he was recognized by the world when he was given the world uh, the, the Nobel Peace Prize because of the um, uh, the steps that he had made, yes, with his brother from um, Eritrea in, term, in, in, in the person of the president. This was the premise upon which he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And here we are, on the other hand, saying that his very action is what has brought about this um, dissension that we see. So was then this awarding of the Nobel Peace Prize worthy from your point of view? I think it is becoming very clear, and uh, it's not just me saying it, but uh, many people are now beginning to recognize that um, the, that award by the Nobel Prize was very premature. I think the, there was such a promise in Abiy in the first few months in office. Uh, he was a leader who came very quickly, uh, reached out to Eritrea, uh, began building you know, a relationship with Eritrea, talked about a peace settlement. I think the world was, was, was disarmed by that, that uh, very energetic uh, you know, movement mm. by, by Abiy. Uh, but let's admit it, you know, the, the Nobel Prize was, was rewarding, I think, uh, potential and mm. uh, was not rewarding something action. that was already there, action. Mm. Mm. So um, over time, I think it became clear that Abi wasn't making any headway. Uh, he was stuck where he was. There is no peace. There is no formal peace settlement with Eritrea. And in hindsight, actually, it will appear that the strategic relationship uh, between Abi and Afewerki was largely about how to contain Tigray and not how to make peace between their two nations. Let's take a break and say goodbye to our audience on KTN Home. We've been with us since uh, 7 o'clock. This is The Situation Room. It's Kenya's biggest conversation. We're having a conversation with uh, Horn of Africa analyst Rashid Abdi uh, dissecting what's happening, what's unfolding in Ethiopia. There has been some major conflict between the federal government and the regional government of uh, Tigray, where the federal government had accused the regional government of uh, sponsoring attacks on a federal military camp. And then there was Syria's uh, dropping of the hammer on that region. Many people have fled. Amnesty International says that um, many have been killed in that conflict so far. We know that there are many who have crossed over from Ethiopia into Sudan uh, seeking refuge. Let's continue that conversation. If you'd like to join the conversation on Spice FM, it's 94.4 in Nairobi and Mombasa is 87.9, 102.5 in Kisumu, Nakuru is 96.0, 96.7 in Eldoret, Nyeri 90.9 and Malindi 97.7. See you again on Monday, KTN Home, and thank you very much for tuning in. Spice FM Nyeri. So we continue the conversation for the next about seven minutes with uh, Rashid Abdi. Rashid, with all these that's happening, would you say that the rest of the country is watching what's happening in Tigray and feeling um, support or expressing support for Tigray or do they express support for the president or are the other regions just sitting back and watching and saying, not my monkey, not my forest? Mm. Um, there's no, I think, um, uh, survey that has been done to find out you know, what public opinion thinks. And um, the fact that the government has imposed a massive uh, media uh, clamp down uh, on Tigray uh, basically uh, means that we don't know what is happening. But all across the country, journalists are being locked up every day. Uh, no one can actually quote any TPLF official. No one can write anything about the conflict without actually going through the military censors. And all this, I think, is a clear indication uh, that there is a deliberate attempt by the state to, to basically uh, uh, popularize its own narrative. But I think uh, if you just look at Twitter, social media, you can clearly see that there's huge, uh, um, I think, anger at this conflict. Many people are very unhappy with war and conflict and say that uh, the prime minister should have exhausted uh, dialogue and should have uh, 
you know, given an opportunity to, to mediation. I think we, I find similar sentiment also internationally, also regionally. There is a lot of, uh, I think, anxiety about where this war is headed. So my, my thinking is that on the whole, public opinion, I think, is heavily on the side of uh, let's stop this war and let's engage. Given that, as you say correctly, um, even within the Romia nation, there doesn't seem to be cohesion. I, I now want you to be speculative here. Uh, how well do you think the Prime Minister, one Mr. Abe Ahmed, is actually going to fare with running this country? I think part of also this uh, crisis we see is, is, is indication of uh, a Prime Minister desperate for regime survival. A Prime Minister who has been severely weakened, uh, who is badly dented, whose credibility has actually suffered uh, so mm. much. And if he can create, I think, an emergency situation in which he can prolong his rule and then somehow find a way to uh, maneuver himself through an election. That, so regime survival calculations are part of this crisis. They are, not, they are not extraneous to it. They are part of this uh, crisis. The prime minister, I think, has lost considerable public support. And this uh, conflict gives him, I think, the kind of um, lifeline he needs to cling on because he mobilizes a certain constituency within Ethiopia that rallies around the flag. And, and so, you know, every beleaguered uh, leader, um, you know, creates conflict abroad. That is, that is uh, what history shows us. And I think this isn't uh, any different. This is a prime minister who actually desperately needed this conflict in order to show up his, his uh, support base. Mm. There's also some stability that is begged because Ethiopia currently is the seat of the African Union. And when you look at all of this, you say that, well, you hope that at the seat there would be some kind of peace and stability. What do you think this says, not just for regional uh, uh, politics and governance, but continent-wide? Absolutely. I think this is the, this is the major, major crisis. Mm. Uh, Ethiopia is an anchor state in the horn. Mm. Uh, if Ethiopia... Um, you know, collapses, the entire Horn region uh, collapses. There is no doubt about it. It is the home of the African Union. It is, uh, you know, the, the region's uh, diplomatic and uh, military uh, power. And I think uh, the crisis there uh, clearly um, is, is a crisis for the entire Horn. Mm -hmm. And this explains why uh, I think uh, both the region and externally, uh, every pressure must be maintained to make sure that uh, this crisis is, is halted. Mm -hmm. uh, have you seen any attempts uh, internationally or regionally to try and mediate this uh, conflict? Uh, sorry, repeat that question. I got a bit lost. <laughs> sorry, uh, ha have there been attempts that you've seen regionally and also internationally to mediate this conflict? Um, I think uh, we are beginning to see pressure building up. I think one critical factor is that um, the Prime Minister launched this uh, attack in the midst of the U.S. elections, and that is deliberate. It's not, it's not coincidental, mm. because the U.S. Uh, is the only single power with leverage to actually influence Ethiopia. It, it is the only country with which the U.S. has the closest security and strategic partnership. And that explains why um, the Prime Minister chose this perfect timing. And it will take almost 10 weeks for the Biden administration to, to come into office. And I think that gives the prime minister that window of 10 weeks to wrap up this conflict. Because I'm sure once uh, the Democrats come into power, they will exert a lot of uh, pressure to stop that conflict. Uh, Ahmed uh, Rashid Abdi, thank you very much for speaking to us today. And it's always a pleasure having you and giving your insights on things that are happening around Africa, especially at the Horn of Africa. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Santa Sana, have a good one.